Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So I'll start you off with a few facts and figures on the global poverty problem. We have about 7 billion people in the world today, and of these 7 billion, very large numbers are suffering really extreme deprivation. So I show you these statistics that you understand what I mean by poverty. It's not the kind of poverty that is commonplace in Britain and other parts of the European Union, but it is really severe, life-threatening poverty, people being chronically undernourished, people lacking access to essential medicines, safe drinking water, shelter, electricity, adequate sanitation, literacy, and many children working for wages outside their own households. What you see here is that about a third of all human deaths are from poverty-related causes, 18 out of 57 million every year, and that's a very conservative statistic in that I have here only counted those deaths that are from causes that are essentially unknown in the rich countries. I have not counted all those people who die in poor countries from diseases that we know only too well, like diabetes, heart attack, and so on. If you put that in perspective, you come to about 400 million deaths from poverty in the last 22 years since the end of the Cold War. And that's more than or about twice as many deaths as died in the entire 20th century from all government-sponsored violence. Wars, civil wars, gulags, concentration camps, Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward. In a whole century, that amounted to 200 million deaths, of course way too many, but poverty kills 400 million in just 22 years. Now that, of course, brings into view our commitment to human rights. We are officially committed to a wonderful list of human rights. This is from the Universal Declaration, but it's repeated in various conventions and treaties. Now, when we think of human rights violations or under fulfillment of human rights, we often think, well, there are these isolated cases. There's this person sitting in a jail. There are these people who have been massacred. We think in terms of dozens or hundreds of people suffering human rights violations. Here we have literally billions of people suffering human rights violations or unfulfilled human rights, to put it somewhat more neutrally for the moment. So this is by far the most widely under-realized, unrealized, unfulfilled human right of all. Now, if you ask me why is this happening, right? Aren't we reading every day in the newspaper that things are getting better, that the world is very wealthy, that the average income in the world is now $10,000 per capita? Well, why are still so many people so life-threateningly poor? The superficial, very superficial answer is it has something to do with the income distribution. It's not that there isn't enough wealth in the world, there is but it's distributed in a somewhat strange way, as you will now see. This here is the top 5% of the human population. They have over 46% of global household income. And just about the same goes to the next 20%. So now we are up to a quarter of the world's population with over 90% of all income already spoken for. So the other three quarters squeeze into the remaining space, and you can see how they do that. If you have good eyes, you can even see the smallest quarter. The lowest quarter, the poorest quarter of the human population, has 0.78% of global household income. Why is income so terribly unequally distributed? And that has actually happened over time, and it has happened in particular in the last 20-odd years, of globalization. It's been a period of rapidly increasing income inequality, both globally and also nationally in almost all states. Exceptions are the Latin American countries, most of them. I think a very important uh, part of the explanation of why that is happening is regulatory capture. Regulatory capture is when people pay money to politicians in one way or the other, in order to influence the way the rules are made, and that is often called lobbying. 
So corporations, rich individuals, banks, industry associations invest a lot of money in lobbying. And I use the word invest advisedly because they see it as an investment. They want something in return for that money. They try to influence the formulation of the rules or the application of the rules. And they do that with an eye to trying to capture more of the social product. And as they capture more of the social product, they become more able to lobby, more able to capture new rules. And so there is a bit of a spiral going on, an inequality spiral, where things get worse and worse in terms of inequality. Now, in the last 20 years or so, this whole well-known game of lobbying and regulatory capture has added a whole new dimension. The whole new dimension is supranational rules. There are a whole new bunch of rules out there above the nation state level, and these rules have newly been shaped. That's when you really want to get into the act of influencing something when it's just being created, when it's just growing. These supranational rules get shaped in uh, negotiations behind closed doors, where even ex post, it is unclear who exactly argued for what, why the rules were shaped this way or the other way. We can't even find out afterwards. Beforehand, there isn't even a text available, a draft text where we can look at and say, well, this is the, what these guys are discussing. None of that. Uh, corporations, of course, get access to texts sometimes, but ordinary citizens have a very hard time to even be informed of what's being discussed. So no democracy up there, no transparency, no accountability even exposed so that we know uh, who argued for what, how certain language got into the treaty. And of course, the result of all that is it's an ideal environment in which you can lobby without leaving any traces. And that is what these companies do. Of course, they lobby through states because states are the ones who send delegates to these negotiations. And which is the most important, the softest target for lobbying? Where do you, if you have a choice, where do you want to invest your lobbying dollar? Well, it's the country where I live, the United States of America, for two very obvious reasons. One is politics is more for sale in the US than anywhere else, almost anywhere else. And second, because the US is still the big kid on the block. If the US wants something in these negotiations, they very often get it much more easily than smaller, less powerful countries. Now, if this explanation were any good, then what you would expect is that those in a position to lobby the US government should have done especially well in the last 20, 25 years or so of global institutional, you know, the emergence of the supranational network. And guess what? This is exactly what we find. We find that over the last 30 years or so, we, first of all, the income share in the US of the bottom half has dropped a lot, but an incredible increase has happened at the very, very top. A 2.6-fold increase of just the top 1% of the US population. But wait, it gets more interesting still. 4.6-fold increase for the top tenth of 1%, and a 7-fold increase for the top 100th of 1%. That is big stuff in a period of 30 years. And you can see the top 0.01%, I should hundredth of 1%, is actually only 14,400 people, uh, tax returns, and 30,000 people roughly if you count their families. So at the top, the richest Americans, 30,000 people, have as much income as 2,800 million people at the bottom. So this is really serious inequality that has accumulated here very, very quickly. Now, I show you this one more time as a graphic. This is the global income distribution now, household income, so not governments, just households. This is what it looked like in 1988, and this is what it looked like 17 years later. What you can see here is that there's only one winner. It's the top 5%. They gained 3.5% of global household income over this period. Everybody else lost. You can see the bottom quarter. They lost the most. They lost fully one-third of their share of global household income, going down from 1.16% to 0.78%. So a pretty dramatic decline. And of course, if you lose a third of your share of global household income, then that rising tide isn't going to do you so much good because you are not actually rising with that tide. K 
key facts from these statistics are first, uh, in these 17 years, the richest 5% have gained more than the poorest half of humanity had left over at the end of that period. Three and a half versus three percent. Three percent is what the bottom half has left. Second, the ratio of average incomes of the richest five percent and the poorest quarter went from 185 to one to 297 to one. Third, had the poorer half held steady, had they just maintained their share of global household income, they would now have 21 percent more. And for the bottom quarter, it's 49 percent more. Finally, if the poorer half had been allowed to gain those 3.5% that, in fact, the richest 5% gained, the poorer half would have doubled its share from 3.5% to 7% of global household income, and they, poverty would already be history if that were reasonably distributed among the poor. 7% is all that's needed to get rid of the kind of severe poverty that I showed you at the beginning. And the top half would still have had 93% left over. So what you see here is that humongous as the problem is, the global poverty problem, in human terms, economically, it's pretty small. It's not a big deal, right, to get 3% reshuffled from the rich to the poor. Again, uh, I remind you of our commitment to human rights. Everyone is entitled, it says in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. That's what we don't have today. We don't have a international order that is hospitable to the fulfillment of human rights. Uh, here is the explanation that I'm offering. There are two different causal lines. They run from the supranational institutional order, this newly emerging architecture, to the fate of poor and vulnerable citizens in less developed countries. The global institutional order influences the fate of the poor in two main ways, partly directly and partly indirectly by influencing the institutions in the developing countries. Here are seven examples, seven kinds of chunks of the international rule putting that are particularly important, I think, for explaining the headwind that is blowing into the faces of the poor. There's the remaining protectionism, something we're all familiar with, that rich countries reserve the right still to protect their markets against imports from developing countries. The biggest uh, factor here that most of you know about are subsidies, in, especially in agriculture, that make it difficult for exports from poor countries to compete. Pollution rules, pollution benefits essentially the rich and harms especially the poor, but there's no compensation paid from those who do the harm to those who are being harmed. Pharmaceuticals, parts of the WTO treaty was the so-called TRIPS agreement, which forced all WTO member states to institute very strong intellectual property protections for pharmaceuticals and seeds and entertainment products, software and so on. Illicit financial flows, more than a trillion dollars, that's a thousand billion or a million million dollars, are flowing out each year out of developing countries into uh, the banking systems of the West and a few tax haven and secrecy jurisdictions. Labor standards, here the big news is we don't have any. And so poor countries are forced into a race to the bottom where each country has to compete by offering to capital investments ever more exploitable, ever more mistreatable workforces, Vietnam against Bangladesh and so on. The four privileges, a very deeply entrenched and often not noticed rule of our international order is that any person or group exercising effective power in a country is considered entitled to sell the natural resources of the country and to borrow money in the name of the people of the country, no matter how they came to power, no matter how they exercise power. So a lot of developing countries are very badly governed, and we like to point that out, you know, that look at these guys, they don't know how to govern themselves. But what we forget is our great contribution to bad governance in the developing countries by recognizing clearly illegitimate rulers who are hated by the people as entitled to sell us 
the resources of the country and to borrow money in the name of the people. The arms trade is another contributor to this. We are exporting lots of arms. The UK is a very big arms exporter, so is the US, Russia, Germany. Uh, arms into these countries, and these arms are very often used for internal repression and also fuel wars and civil wars that again try uh, people to get people into power where they can then exercise these privileges. So these are just some examples of how our supranational institutional order works against the interests of the poor. The immediate responsibility for these defects lies with governments, especially the more powerful ones who are formulating and enforcing these rules. But indirectly, of course, the responsibility is ours because we as citizens of these countries, we are responsible for what our government does in our name. And so we also are implicated in the harms that these global institutional structures are doing. So I think we have two different citizen responsibilities. One is uh, to work towards supranational institutional arrangements that would impose less harm upon the poorer half of humanity. And secondly, insofar as we can, to compensate for some of the harms that these institutions do. We have an organization that's about a year and a half old now called ASAP, Academic Stand Against Poverty, with which I want to quickly conclude. And we try to work, try to bring the creativity and the special skills of academics to bear on the poverty problem. A lot of academics are already involved on the wrong side of the issue. A lot of economists in particular are uh, economists for hire uh, who are essentially beautifying the facts about global poverty and also defending the kinds of institutions that are now in place. We also point to the great urgency of this problem. Uh, I showed you in the beginning the statistics about how much harm poverty causes and the easy avoidability given existing economic and technological resources. These are five projects that we currently have in progress. Uh, the first one is Know Your Rights India. The idea is to develop a website where Indian citizens can find in one place, clickable as a tree diagram, so to speak, all the rights and entitlements that they have, and they have plenty. The problem in India is that very few of these rights are actually accessible to people. It's very difficult to get them, and you have to bribe officials often in order to get what officially you're entitled to. We want on this website to tell people where they can complain, which NGO will give them pro bono support, and we also have a small little army of uh, middle-class Indian students standing by who will walk with poor families or poor people to the relevant office and just sit there as witnesses and see how people are treated when they try to insist on their rights. Supply chain of universities, this was started at the University of Connecticut. Uh, universities are themselves big consumers. They buy office furniture and books and souvenirs and food and so on. And what about the supply chain? Who is involved in supplying these things to the university and who are the suppliers of the suppliers? We want to look here in particular at labor standards and environmental standards in order to ensure that universities set a good example in buying carefully. Moral psychology and poverty alleviation, the attempt to understand why the poverty problem is one that so many people vaguely know about, but so few people actually pay enough attention to. And then maybe the most topical of all for the moment is the MDG successes. The Millennium Development Goals expire in 2015, and there's a huge process now going on in this academic year, basically from summer 12 to summer 13, to develop the successors. And uh, ASAP works alongside a big organization of NGOs, about 400 different NGOs beyond 2015, to develop alternatives. We don't want another wish list of the sort that we've had before. It would be nice if poverty were halved. It would be nice if this and that happened. We want concrete responsibilities which tell specific named agents what they need to do in order to reduce poverty. And finally, the Health Impact Fund is a different way of incentivizing pharmaceutical innovation. The basic idea being that we want pharmaceutical innovators people who develop new medicines to have the option to be paid differently from how they are paid today. Today they are paid by high markups they can charge protected by patents for their new medicines. 
we want them to have a second option, which is to be paid on the basis of the health impact of the new medicine, what the medicine achieves in the world, on condition that they sell it at cost. So if there were such a second track, then we would have a certain supply of new medicines that would be available very cheaply from day one. They would be especially medicines for the diseases of the poor, where you can't make a lot of money by marking up the price. And so poor people, too, would get a good bit of benefit from pharmaceutical innovation. I'll stop here. Thank you.